Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up this week on One Detroit Arts and Culture. It's a flashback to holidays downtown, as the Detroit Historical Museum celebrates Hudson's during the holidays. Plus, a musical tribute at the University of Michigan to Matthew Shepard's legacy, more than 20 years after his murder shook the nation. And then, the wonder of glass blowing. It's all just ahead on One Detroit Arts and Culture. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, and viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit Arts and Culture. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for being with me as we ring in the holiday season. Coming up, you may remember the decorations, Santa, and the magic of shopping Hudson's over the holidays. Well, the Detroit Historical Museum felt this year was the perfect time to celebrate the spectacle of Hudson's during the holidays with a new exhibit. We'll have it for you. Then the power of music and art to pay tribute to the most difficult of tragedies. The murder of gay college student Matthew Shepard over 20 years ago was a hate crime that shocked the world. Well, this weekend, Detroit Public Television is airing a performance from the University of Michigan called Considering Matthew Shepard. We have a look at the production for you. And then we'll end with April Wagner as she takes us into her Epiphany Studios where she creates intricate pieces of glass art. It is all coming up on One Detroit Arts and Culture. All right, and let's start things off with some holiday cheer. If you grew up around here, you probably remember Hudson's. Maybe you shopped downtown at Christmas, you saw Santa, maybe you had some Santa bears. Well, my mom still has a Santa bear mug. She still drinks from it, true story. Well, this year, the Detroit Historical Museum is celebrating that Detroit tradition with an exhibit called Hudson's Holidays. Take a look. When I think of the holidays, I think of Hudson's. Growing up in Detroit, one of my first memories of the holidays was getting all dressed up and going downtown to Hudson's to visit Santa. I became enthralled with the store and the traditions the first time my folks brought me downtown to the store, and I'd never seen a store that big, and I just went nuts. Nobody did it quite like Hudson's did it. From the big tree to all the, the beautiful things to buy, I mean, it really was a place of wonder. The show began on the sidewalk. The minute you came inside, you were literally thrown into a different world with beautiful architecture and lighting and drapes and things like that. You forgot all your troubles. We're sitting here today in um, the main area of our Hudson's Holiday exhibit in the Detroit Historical Museum. The holidays are a time when you want to share stories with your family. You want your kids to experience the things that you experienced when you were a kid. And one of the things that we hear about here at the Detroit Historical Society most often is Hudson's. The company meant so much to so many people in this marketplace. That store, you know, during the holidays employed 10,000 people. 100,000 people a day would visit that building to not only shop but dine. The company through the years created so many of our iconic events. The Thanksgiving Day Parade was begun by the company in 1924. Hudson's was a huge department store, and it had restaurants, it had Santa, and it was kind of the special place that you went, particularly at the holiday season. Here at the museum, we wanted people to have the idea and the feeling of what that might have been like years ago when, when our grand department store, Hudson's, was in its heyday. What we did is we edited down a lot of things. What would be the most relevant for the greater public? 
there's a surprise and a delight to take you back to that Hudson's holiday experience. And I love that about how we've set it up here. It's not just one place, but it really is a, um, a vibe, if you will. This exhibition was designed in much the same way that a department store was, is exactly what our exhibits team was thinking about when, when they put this thing together. We've created 11 pop-ups all through the, the museum space. When I was first touring this as it was kind of being put up, I realized, you know, as you walk down the stairs, right at the bottom of the stairs is some signage and advertising from Hudson's back in their basement shops, which were kind of their bargain. That's where you got the term bargain basement, right? One of the things that I love is that we actually created a little mini pop-up exhibit inside of the elevator. And so it's really fun that we've been able to recreate that experience of going from floor to floor and experiencing this big department store by putting those departments in different places all throughout the museum. The Santa Bears are my favorite part of this exhibition. Um, I think the first Santa Bear came out in 1985. I remember that one. I definitely remember the 1986 bear because he had the, the little 1986 on the, the sweater. But uh, we always got Santa Bears for Christmas. Every year the Santa Bears were part of our Christmas tradition. My favorite part of the museum, you know, I'm, I kind of really love holiday sparkles, so I do love all of the Christmas lights and the sparkly stuff here in Toyland, which is where we're sitting. Um, I also really love the fashion. Our fashion collection here at the Society is amazing. In terms of what the public will be interested in, certainly Santa Bears <laughs> has created a huge interest just from the social media thus far. Uh, the delivery wagon, that was created for the 75th anniversary of the company. Shopping bags, you know, uh, that we hadn't previously displayed through the years. Uh, photographs that we blew up, things that were uh, donated from the public. The red carpet that you see here as you come into the Toyland area. It's interesting when you think about kids now having the experience of, you know, shopping purely online. Like, they don't even get the big Christmas catalog, much less the experience of going to a really beautiful department store or, or even a mall. And so bringing an exhibit back like this one, where it is all decorated and everything is sparkly and beautiful, and you get to remember that and feel really special for a minute, gives the kids the opportunity to experience something that they're they're not experiencing in real life anymore. This museum is a place where we want families to come together and come and visit us during the holidays. We brought this really nostalgic exhibition um, to the public for that reason. It's about life and family and the opportunity to be together, which you know these days is certainly not something to be taken for granted. So I really do think that um, it really is an inclusive exhibition that people can come and um, just really you know, remember a simpler time and be um, amazed by these toys. I think when, whenever you have the experience of being put back into a specific time, you have this moment where you get to imagine what it was to be there at that time, what those people's lives were like. I really hope that people come and enjoy it and feel really good when they're here. I hope they take away, you know, feeling of joy. This exhibit is going to remind you once again what it means to share memories with your family. It's kind of the perfect entry to that holiday season for everybody. For more on Hudson's holidays, just head to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. The University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance, along with the U of M Museum of Modern Art, collaborated on a project that is heading to Detroit Public Television this weekend. It's called Considering Matthew Shepard. Matthew Shepard was a 19-year-old gay college student at the University of Wyoming, and it was 23 years ago that he was brutally murdered. This production is a musical response to that hate crime and Matthew's legacy. One Detroit's Zosette Gear has the story.
Considering Matthew Shepard is what we consider a passion oratorio uh, that was composed by conductor and composer Craig Heller Johnson, uh, and it is a, a powerful work that is what we consider a musical exploration about the life and death of Matthew Shepard. Uh, in October 1998, Matthew Shepard was uh, brutally killed uh, by two individuals who pretended to be gay. Um, and sadly, um, after that, that tragic evening, uh, he was discovered 18 hours later and died five days afterwards in the hospital in, in Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, and so this work um, is a meditation, if you will. There's so many ways that Craig could have told the story. Uh, I'm even moved by simply the title, Considering Matthew Shepard, that first of all sets us in a state of, let's just pause, let's just take a moment and not point a finger at his perpetrators. We need to tell that story, but, but think about ourselves as we relate to Matt and think about ourselves and how we can even see ourselves actually in the story in the lives of his perpetrators and that hate will not win uh, in any form. As we think about social injustices in our world and all that we're dealing with, it's good to be reminded that love and forgiveness and that and in opposition to hate, those things will overshadow hate in the end. And I think we, we need that. We need that reminder as human beings. We need that reminder more than ever today in our world. Uh, and I, I, I believe that that's what our students, I know that's what our students are drawn to. We all want to be inspired. And this work constantly reminds us love and forgiveness in the end will win. Working with these talented students here at the University of Michigan is truly one of my greatest joys uh, in my life. And it was shocking to me to realize that these students actually did not know Matthew Shepard's story. Uh, and so, you know, it was such a powerful moment in my life as an African-American gay man uh, and someone who remembers all of that went into that and to realize that they're of eight, the undergraduates especially, had never even heard of him. Telling that story with these incredible young uh, students, seeing how they have taken to this, uh, not only the music but that story, has been inspiring. It has been, uh, I've been encouraged to realize that our future is bright. I believe a uh, conductor has to program works of the past as well as the present. And so not only do we need to study great works by Handel and Bach and Brahms, but we need to keep telling stories also about today. This work can stand on its own musically. It is not just uh, a, a, what some may say a piece of you know, propaganda. It is not that at all. It is a, a work that is rooted in great stories as well as great musical um, styles and compositional technique. And so I'm a firm believer in telling disparate stories, as many disparate stories as possible on the stage. Can every audience member in some way or form see themselves through the stories that we tell on the stage. I think choral music, vocal music, choral music is positioned in a very unique way because of the stories we can tell with a community of voices, not just one person, but to see the different backgrounds from these students telling the story together as a community. Uh, we've missed that in COVID. And so this story right now, as well as telling the story together, it's been transformative for all of us. I would hope that people would watch this with an open mind. Um, there are some 
uh, powerful moments. There are some tough moments. We're not trying to preach. We're not trying to uh, tell people how to think. I think Craig says it best. We're just asking them to consider, to just meditate, to just think about ourselves as it relates to Matthew and, and, and others. Some stormy story waiting to be told Where, oh, where has the innocence gone? I think one of the things that's so special about music is because we get to, no matter what a person's background is, no matter what their socioeconomic status, religion, when we sit down together and focus all of our energies on this gift, I call it a gift, of music and these stories, nothing else matters. Making music together with all of those individuals as a community, our hearts beating together as one, that forms lifelong memories that, um, that, that really unites us. For more information on Considering Matthew Shepard, which will air on December 11th here on Detroit Public Television, just go to our website at OneDetroitPBS.org. All right, turning now to the artistry of blowing glass. Metro Detroit glass artist April Wagner is the owner and the lead artist at Epiphany Studios, and she let us take a look at how she creates her magical pieces, including ornaments for the holidays. Glass isn't like any other material. It's very responsive, it's very visceral, it's an intimate experience. I always knew I wanted to be an artist from a young age, and then after I graduated, went to New York for a little while and was studying ceramics. I ended up taking a glass class when I was in college there, and it was just like one of those moments where you realize, oh my gosh, this is an epiphany, this is what I want to do. I feel like in my work I try to encapsulate like that moment in time or that thing just on the edge of turning into something else, like the motion of a thing or just like something caught in time. And so I hope that that is what the viewer is taking away from it. Glass is a craft, so there is the technique piece where you have to learn how to manipulate the material, and then a more esoteric piece, which is where you learn to think creatively. What could I do with this material? How can I express myself? What am I thinking about as I'm working with it? What do I want the viewer to see, or how do I want the viewer to feel when they look at the piece? So my work over the years has grown and transformed as I've transformed and I've tried to maintain a trueness to both of those things. So the studio creates a line of functional pieces which are very technically based and require um, a high level of skill set and then I also create a series of sculptures that I take those skills then and I express myself in a more freeform manner using the glass as a sculptural element. I like to play with the glass and I like to respond to what the glass is doing. And I'm always really interested in what that could turn into. We use a blowpipe, which is about four feet long. It's a stainless steel tube, so it has a hole through the center of it. And you'll get the glass on the tip of it. And I will equate it to people like when you're trying to get honey out of a honey jar and you use that stick, it's the same process. You kind of have to twirl it so it stays on there. Otherwise, gravity is going to pull it to the floor and you manipulate it the whole time on that blowpipe. Blow again. The blowpipe is like a baton. You can twirl it around any direction you want. Shapes are done a little bit with centrifugal force and a little bit with gravity, and then I'm manipulating them with hand tools. So I've transferred it from the blowpipe, which it has a hollow um, center through the middle of, middle of it to the solid rod, which is called the punty rod. So basically, I've, I've shaped the piece as much as I can on the blowpipe, and now I'm gonna finish it over here. We're really fortunate we have such a great team right now. I will design all of the pieces in the studio, and then I'll have one of the other artists I work with make them because 
Glass blowing is such a physical endeavor. I really only have so much capacity and I want to really focus on the sculptural work with that. Most of my work is site-specific, so it's driven by the environment, the specifics of the environment, what kind of lighting is available, and who the viewer is. Our clear glass comes from North Carolina, and when it comes to us, it's silica, soda ash, limestone, and we'll take that and we'll put it into the 2,400 degree furnace. And it will sit in that furnace for approximately 12 hours while it cooks and turns into glass. And then we turn the furnace down to 2,000 degrees. So now we've got our clear glass ready to go. And depending on if we're going to use color or not, we'll introduce the colors at different points, depending on what kind of piece we're making. Those colors come from manufacturers in Germany and Australia, and they're formulated with different minerals and metallic oxides that are combined with a glass base that matches my clear base. So there's a little bit of chemistry in glass in that each of those chemicals that make those colors has to fit. For example, copper is a really interesting one. Copper can be red, it can be green, or it can be blue, depending on what else it's mixed with with the glass. I really have an affinity for the colors that have, they're called reactionary colors, and they have a gold and silver metallic sheen to them. I think that they encompass all the awesome things about glass. You know, super sparkly, a little bit transparent, a little bit opaque, depending on how the light's looking at it, and just really fits in a lot of environments. It could go in a contemporary home, it could go in a traditional home. It, it, everyone likes it. It's like the universal favorite. Education is a huge part of people understanding value. Twice a year we open our doors for the public to come in and watch us blow glass. We offer a hands-on experience where people can try making their own glass piece because I've realized over the years that we make it look easy and it's not. <laughs> so we like to get people in there, let them figure out, oh my gosh, it is really hot and it is hard to work with. But then also for them to have that experience and that memory when they look at that piece. I think people like glass because it seems like it's alive. It's something you want to touch. It sparkles. It really reacts well with light. So it um, draws us to it and I think we use glass in so many different ways in our lives I mean eyeglasses glass in our cars glass in skyscrapers glass you know to look through the Hubble telescope into Mar at Mars and the technology that goes into glass manufacturing is so crazy exciting I think as an artist I feel like that also adds to my passion of what I can do with this material I'm definitely much more interested in the process than I am in the product. You know, I have pieces that are all over the country that I will probably never actually see in person again, and I'm good with that. Because for me, I feel like the spirit of that piece is embodied inside of me. I did a piece for a hospital a couple of years ago, and the idea that so many people were going to be in that space, and probably not there for a good reason, and to be able to give them something else to contemplate, maybe take them to a different place for a while and have respite is really a powerful thing. I love animals and we have a relationship with the Humane Society where we create work that we then donate a portion of the proceeds back to the Humane Society. I adopted my cat from there and that makes me feel really good because as an artist, you don't have a lot of extra money and one of the ways I can give back is to do things like that. I think that we live in such a consumer society. The nicest gift you can give is something that's handmade. And supporting a local artist is keeping money in the economy around you, supporting creativity, you know, adding uh, uniqueness to your area. And I think people appreciate that. For more on our arts and culture stories, our live performances, just head to OneDetroitPBS.org for more, as well as on social media at One Detroit. You can find us there. That is going to do it for me this week, but I'm going to leave you with a look at a beautiful musical performance by Olivia Deer from Detroit Performs, live from Mary Grove. I'll see you next week. Take care. Woke up in the middle of the night cause I don't sleep so well with you so far away. This rogue is the better of me It's nice to know that some things never change 
You've been running at the speed of light Haven't slept since last July And I've been saving up But I'm still spent So someday soon we'll have enough For a house on a hill or a corner lot And it'll all be worth it I want a house, a home But memories don't haunt No, they just hold you close Every day we wake up, we're just glad to know I've got you, you've got me, we've got these four walls to call home. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia Esselford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, and viewers like you.